right, if you have your copy of God's Word, please turn to Genesis chapter 12, and we will be reading verses 1 to 3, and then you need to skip over uh, about 10 chapters to chapter 22, and we will just be reading verse 18. So Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, and then uh, we'll skip to chapter 22 and verse 18. Let us hear the word of the Lord together. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And then to chapter 22 and verse 18. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. This is the word of the Lord. All right, so now it's time to uh, test your memory. No looking at your notes, Sandy. All right, all right. Let's test your memory. Somebody already tried to guess this morning and they kind of had the right idea, but they weren't quite there yet. Do we remember what our first candle was from last week? Curse breaker. breaker. Yes, well done. John, I heard your voice loud and clear, right? And curse breaker is what we were looking at. And we looked at uh, Genesis chapter 3 in the last part where God is uh, specifically talking to the serpent and to Eve and then to Adam. And he is... um, bringing curses against their failure to obey. And they came against the serpent as well because he's the one who tempted uh, Eve, who then gave the fruit to uh, Adam. Please note, it is not an apple. Somebody asked me that last week. It is not an apple. If you want to know what fruit it is, you can ask me after because I have the definitive answer. All right. Uh, But the serpent was the one who was cursed uh, along with Eve and with Adam. But within that... We saw for the very first time God's plan to bring someone who would break the curses. Someone who though they would be bruised, though they would be wounded, they would be victorious over the serpent by crushing his head. And it talked about the seed of Eve. And it talked about he, a singular male who would come. Now there's no more details than that that are given, but now we know that there is somebody who is coming, somebody that we can expect, somebody that we can look to who will defeat Satan and who will defeat sin and who will defeat death. And we saw as we jumped into the New Testament that that is Jesus himself. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that today as we have looked Uh, as we have read uh, Genesis chapter 3 and have been looking uh, through these passages in Genesis. And again, they don't sound very Christmassy when we read them because, you know, there's no angelic visits and there's no Mary and there's no Joseph yet and there's no Magi yet. But we know that because of these passages, it's pointing us to Christmas. So we're looking for the one to come, and that is the name of our series, Christmas in Genesis. And we are exploring uh, the beginning of God's plan for Jesus to come. That's what we are doing. We're exploring the beginning of God's plan for Jesus to come. Now, sometimes we make plans, and uh, sometimes, you know, we make plans and they actually work out. Have we experienced that before? We've made plans and they've actually worked out. And uh, sometimes we have made plans. And they haven't worked out. Sometimes they haven't gone the way we have wanted them to. Sometimes we've had to go to plan B or to plan C. Or sometimes we just have to scrap the plan altogether and start over. Uh, A few uh, quotes on plans. Uh, So, wow, we're going backwards there. Here we go, finally. We get there. A few plans. Any Swifties here today? That means you're a fan of Taylor Swift, except for Lucas. No, all right. Thank you, Lucas. Can always count on Lucas for (laughs) musical references. All right. Taylor Swift says this: just because you made a good plan doesn't mean that's what's gonna happen. And she's right. That's no great big philosophical statement. 
J.R.R. Tolkien in The Hobbit says this, it does not do to leave a dragon out of your calculations if you live near one, right? Uh, and that's true. Fortunately, none of us have experienced that. Uh, Robert Burns, who the great Scottish poet, uh, when he was uh, tilling a field, he recognized that as he was tilling that field, he destroyed the home of a mouse. And so he wrote a whole poem about it. It's called To a Mouse. And it's where this line comes from that you might be familiar with. But mouse, you are not alone. Improving foresight may be in vain. The best laid schemes of mice and men go often askew and leaves us nothing but grief and pain for promised joy. So we had a plan. We knew if it came together, that would be great. But sometimes that plan doesn't. And what we thought was going to bring joy brings grief and pain. Elias, uh, Elizabeth Elliot, who is the wife of Jim Elliot, uh, the missionary who was martyred, uh, says this. When our plans are interrupted, his, meaning God's, are not. His plans are proceeding exactly as scheduled, moving us always, including those minutes or hours or years which seem most useless or wasted or unendurable. Even when we're facing those difficult times in life, God's plan is moving us forward in the direction that he would like us to go. And that's what we want to focus on today, is we want to focus on God's plan. Because God's plan is always moving forward, and God's plan is always coming to fruition. And we're going to see that in the passages that we are looking at. So again, today's passages are not traditional Christmas passages, but Christmas is more than angels and shepherds and Mary and Joseph and a birth. It is about the one to come. And we looked at this quote last week, and it says this, Advent is more than a nice tale about a baby being born in difficult circumstances. It is the strategy of God and the tactics of the sun. It's about life, death, blood, confrontation, darkness, light, and war. It is the clash of two kingdoms. And of God's kingdom, I would add, being victorious. Right. So God's plan carries on, and we see that uh, God is the one who is making things happen. And I came across this interesting statement, and you can kind of dwell on it maybe through the rest of the week, but James Montgomery Boyce says this. When he talks about God's plan, it continues to move through Abram, who eventually his name is changed to Abraham. He says this, with the exception of Jesus Christ, Abraham is probably the most important person in the Bible. With the exception of Jesus Christ, Probably, uh, Abraham is probably the most important person in the Bible. And that kind of caught me, because I never really, you know, thought too deeply about it, because the Bible is all about Jesus. But he says this, and I thought, wow, that's kind of an interesting thought. And it kind of made me think, if I was in Bible school, I would probably write a paper on this and see if uh, Mr. James Montgomery Boyce is correct. But this is what he went on to say. He said, you know, when you think about Moses, Moses, of course, is the lawgiver. He's the one who went up on the top of the mountain and God gave him the Ten Commandments and he is the one, if you, you know, read through Exodus and you read through Leviticus and you read through Deuteronomy and Moses, of course, wrote the first five books of the Bible, here he is, the great lawgiver. And then after Moses is Joshua and Joshua is the great general. He is the one who led the Israelites into the promised land to take the promised land that God had given them. And then you think about David. David is the great king. David is the one who uh, the Old Testament looks back to and says he is the one who has a heart after God and that all the other kings that come after David are compared to him. And then, of course, there's the great prophet Elijah. The great prophet Elijah, who in the midst of a lot of turmoil that was uh, in Israel at the time that he was living, he was the one who brought God's voice to the people. He was the one who told them where it was at and what they needed to do. And then we think of Daniel. Daniel was the great statesman. He was taken as a young man out of Israel, and he was taken uh, as a captive, and he was pressed into service under Nebuchadnezzar, and he served there for the rest of his life from the time that he was about 17, and God used him in a mighty way. He was the great statesman because he was faithful to God. So we have the great lawgiver, and we have the great general, and we have the great king, and we have the great prophet, and we have the great statesman. And James Montgomery Boyce says this about all of them. As great as they were, every single one of them would look back to Abraham and say, he is greater than me because of his faith. Because he is the father of the faith. 
And then they went on, he goes on to say this. He said, you know, none of us may be obviously the great lawgiver because that role was already taken. None of us may be a great general. Not many of us were in the military. None of us really are going to be a great king, right? Unless somehow in your lineage something happens and you are plucked out of obscurity to become a king or a queen of a nation. None of us are going to be a prophet like Elijah. None of us are going to be great statements like Daniel. But who was Abraham? Abraham who was, was one who was simply called by God. That's it. Abraham was somebody who was called by God. Abraham is the man of faith, and all of us can be people of faith. All of us can be people of faith. And he is the one that even Paul in the New Testament points back to again and again. Genesis 12, of course, comes on the heels of Genesis chapter 11. That's not a staggering statement in any way, because we can all count. But in Genesis chapter 11, we read about man's plan, right? It's the Tower of Babel, where man kind of Come, kind of comes together, and uh, they were supposed to scatter and spread across the earth. They chose not to do that. They chose to all gather on the plain of Shinar, which is where eventually the city of Babylon is built, and that's a good thing to trace all the way through scripture. But as they are building this tower, you know what they want to do? They want to make a great name for themselves. And they want to build this tower to the heavens so everybody can see it and everybody will come and be a part of this community that they are building. And they wanted essentially to replace God with their plan. So God put an end to that and he went and he scattered them with the different languages uh, that we, many of us still speak today. Some, of course, are dead and gone. But that was humanity's plan. Humanity's plan was to uh, supplant God and become great and give themselves a great name. But notice what happens when God calls Abraham. In verse 2, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. Who's doing the work? God is doing the work. It's God's plan, and God is the one who is pushing his plan forward. So three simple things I want to uh, address today. And one is just simply a reminder, trust God. Trust God. This is something I think, again, is in some ways it is so simple a part of our faith, and yet we don't always do it, do we? We're not always trusting God in everything. We like to kind of fit our plan in there somewhere, and, and, and we uh, like to ask God to bless our plans rather than us asking what his plan is. And so it begins with Abraham with simply a call to leave, a call to leave. Now let's consider this call to leave for a moment, right? In verse 1, the Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land that I will show you. Now consider about this. Consider this. God is saying to Abram, you need to leave everything that you would call security in your life. Everything that you are familiar with. Everything that, that uh, gives you support in life. You need to go away from that. You need to leave it. The NASB puts it this way. You need to go forth from your country and go forth from your relatives and go forth from your father's house. It's a narrowing focus. Leave your country, leave your relatives, leave your father's house. Those things that you depend on in life, you need to step away from. The reason is that you need to completely trust me, Abram. When I am calling you, you need to hear the voice that I am speaking to you, and you need to follow me. Notice... um, God doesn't actually tell him where he's going. Did you pick up on that? Just the land I will show you, right? Abram doesn't have a GPS. He's not going to be able to find it on his own. God has to call him, and Abram doesn't even know where he's going when God calls him. Would you go? Would you go? If God called you to leave everything that you know is familiar to follow him, Would you trust the voice of God enough to leave it all behind and go? That's a challenge. We're we're pretty comfortable in North America. 
We've got a lot of things that the world doesn't have. Perhaps we've lived in our homes for years or decades. There are things that we really like and we'd love to hold on to those things. Maybe we're close to family. Maybe we like the area that we live in. What if God called you to go? And before you think that, well, you know, I'm a little established in life and I'm a little older, so God probably wouldn't call me. Abram was 75 years old when God called him to go. 75 years old when God called him to go. But isn't this similar to the gospel call? When Jesus is calling us, he's calling us to be ready to let everything else go and to follow him wherever he may lead. This is R. Kent Hughes who says this, this call to forsake all is very much like the call of the gospel. And Jesus said, whoever loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And for whoever would save his life would lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. The gospel call calls us to rest all our hope on the word of Christ and nothing else. So just like Abraham was called by God, we are called to follow Jesus in the same way. It's a call to trust God above all else. It is a call to trust God's plan above all else. Even as the earlier quote by Elizabeth Elliot said, that even when the years are mundane or they are difficult or they are challenging, God is moving along, us along in his plan. Are we trusting God's plan? That leads us to the second point. God fulfills what he promises. God fulfills what he promises. Notice again what he promises. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, those are some remarkable promises that God is making. Those are some remarkable promises that God is making. So remember, at the time of this call, it's only Abraham and Sarah. Abraham is 75, Sarah is 65 years old. They have no children. And here God is saying that I will make you into a great nation. How is that going to happen? They are past the childbearing years and this plays itself out all the way until Genesis chapter 18. And it becomes very challenging and Abram and Sarah at some point actually try to put matters into their own hands and they try to create their own plan and set God's plan aside which brings disastrous consequences in Genesis chapter 16. So that's quite a remarkable promise that God is making. Will Abram believe? Will Abram believe? Now if you're honest, you would probably think, oh God, here. That's kind of a crazy plan. I don't, I don't really know how that's going to happen. I don't really know how you're going to pull this off because it's just me and I'm old and it's Sarah and she's old and you know, we don't have any kids and you want us to pack up everything and travel to some land that you're going to show to and somehow we're going to become a great nation. Now let's consider that for a moment. Abram's line will have a global influence, right? Abram's line will have global influence, right? So what God is promising them is a nation. So a nation is defined by a common land, language, and government, right? We live in the nation of Canada. We have a common land, the second biggest uh, national mass in the world. We have a common language. We actually have two in Canada, French and English, and we have a common government. We have a federal authority over us. Now think about what that would have meant to Abram. Who led nations in Abram's day? Were they elected? No. A king. A king would lead a nation in Abram's day. So now we're getting a hint of a royal lineage that is going to come. A royal lineage is going to come. Abram's line will have global influence. They will become a nation. And then we know under King David, they were a global influence. Uh, God says to him that uh, I will make your name great. Now consider that. 
Uh, Today, Abraham is considered the father of the three great monotheistic religions, right? Everybody honors Abraham. The Muslims honor Abraham, the Jews honor Abraham, the Christians honor Abraham. His name will be great. But not only that, the influence of Abram's people, the Jewish people in the history of the world has been quite remarkable in finance, in culture, uh, in science. They have had incredible influence in the world. And so we see that Abraham's name is great, that the global influence has happened and actually continues to happen. And we also see Uh, Thirdly, coming up, so his name will be great, but not only that, Abram's line will be protected. And that's where we look at verse three. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. Now we know there is no doubt that the line of Abraham has also faced a lot of suffering. Have they not? They have faced a lot of suffering. But even throughout their suffering, They have continued to prosper. Just think of their time in Egypt. For 430 years, they were in captivity. Eventually, a pharaoh came into power that did not know Joseph, and he wanted to wipe out the race. He wanted to commit genocide, right? He wanted to kill all the babies two years and under. And what did the midwives do? They protected all the Abraham, the Hebrew babies as best that they could and God blessed them because of it and they became a numerous nation even in captivity eventually the judgment of God fell against Egypt they were protected and they continue to be protected and we see that one uh, person I was reading said this even today the nations that have tried to destroy the Jewish people have all come to defeat the Germans in World War II came to defeat and there are even nations today and their desire is to destroy the nation of Israel and they continue to be kept at bay so Abraham's line is being protected even biblically we can go back to uh, Esther and Haman we can look at the exile where nations tried to destroy them but they could not be destroyed and so God fulfills his promises right is does abraham's line have a global influence well they certainly have had in the past and still do to some degree today abraham's name is great there is no doubt about that and abraham's line has been protected god is fulfilling all of these promises to abraham (coughs) thirdly abraham's seed provides blessing for everyone Abraham's seed will provide blessing for everyone. Now here in chapter 12, it's not really all that clear. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. How does that happen? What is God referring to when he says that? Well, that's where we need to go up over to Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18. And you may recall this is uh, one of the most significant passages in all of the book of Genesis, but this is where Abraham is tested. Abraham has gained uh, the land. He has been put into the land, and now uh, he has had Isaac born to him. Isaac is the heir of all these promises that God has given to him. And now God comes to Abraham and says, "Um, I want Isaac back. I want you to sacrifice your son, Isaac. Give him back to me. Now chapter 12 is already tough enough. I want you to leave everything you're comfortable and familiar with and go to the land I will show you. Now I want Isaac back. And without getting into too much detail here, because there's a lot of theological depth in these verses, uh, of course, Abraham being the man of faith and who has grown in his faith, he follows through with God's plan, showing his obedience. God stops the sacrifice. Isaac is spared by a substitute. That's an important thing to remember. And then we read this, uh, starting in verse 15 of Genesis 22. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring... If you have a different translation than the one I'm reading, it might have the word seed there, singular. And through your seed, all nations on earth will be blessed because you 
have obeyed me. Well, that's remarkable. God is continuing his line. We read about that as we just have in Genesis 22, 17, and 18. But then that promise is reiterated to Isaac in chapter 26. And then we move all the way ahead to Matthew chapter 1. And how does Matthew chapter 1 begin? Anybody know? The genealogy. And notice what it says in verse 1. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of who? Abraham. And Matthew traces Jesus' genealogy all the way back to David and then to Abraham to prove his messianic credentials because he must come from the line of David and he must come from the line of Abraham. And Matthew establishes that. But then go over to Luke chapter 1. And notice what, uh, this is Zechariah, and this is uh, his song um, that uh, he writes. It's called Zechariah's Song or the Benedictus. And then in verse 68, he says this. Praise to be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. So Zechariah knows what's coming with the birth of his son, John the Baptist, who is the one who makes way for the Lord. And then to verse Uh, 72 and 73. To show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham. He remembers the promise that God has given to Abraham long, long, long ago. And that now God is fulfilling that promise. If you move over to Acts chapter 3 and verse 25, this is Peter who is preaching. And as he's preaching, he says this in chapter 3 in verse 25. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring or seed, all peoples on earth will be blessed. Verse 26, when God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you, uh, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. He's referencing Jesus in that context. If we jump over to Galatians chapter 3, and here uh, Paul is trying to correct the terrible theology of the Galatians who are being swayed away. And he says in verse 8, the scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So when Paul is writing to the Galatians and he's thinking about Genesis 12, he's saying, here's the gospel. The gospel all those thousands of years ago was being uh, created and was being articulated way back in Abraham's day with the promise that God gave to Abraham. And then he says down in verse 16, he says this, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. Paul's point is the gospel comes before the law. The gospel comes before the law, and he points to Jesus Christ. So when we read these passages like Genesis chapter 3 and Genesis chapter uh, 12, and we're going to be in Genesis chapter 13 next week, and then in the week after, Genesis chapter 49, as Jesus explained in Luke 24, all the law and all the prophets are about him. He's making it clear, clear, that Jesus is the one that we were to expect. Again, the idea of seed being singular, being singular, who is Christ. Uh, John uh, uh, Ankerberg says this, because of space limitations, we cannot describe in detail the increasingly narrow parental line God revealed. However, a brief outline of the scriptural promises reveals that God's special person the one to come, could only come out of the following lineage and circumstances. From the seed of the woman, any possible man. 
From Abraham, one man's descendants are selected from all men on earth. From Isaac, not Ishmael, one half of Abraham's lineage is eliminated. Genesis 26, 2-4. From Jacob, not Esau, one half of Isaac's lineage is now eliminated. From Jesse, and then from, uh, from David, Jesse had at least sons, seven are now eliminated. From Bethlehem, all cities in the world are now eliminated but one. God, throughout Scripture, continues to narrow it down so we cannot mistake who the Messiah is. He makes it abundantly clear so we can understand. It is Jesus who is God's plan. He is the one who will do what needs to be done. Jesus is not just the conqueror of the Satan, but he is the blesser of all people who put their faith in him. So how do we conclude? Let us conclude this way. God's plan carries on. Everything is pointing us to the one to come. And we can trust God because he always fulfills his promises. He never fails at doing that. God promised the world that the world would be blessed through the seed or the offspring of Eve in Genesis 3 and now of Abraham in Genesis 12 and Genesis chapter 22. God is moving towards what we celebrate on Christmas Day, the coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1.20, the Amplified Bible says this, for as many as are the promises of God in Christ, they are all answered yes. So through him we say our amen to the glory of God. So the second candle is this. The first one is curse breaker. The second one is this. Blesser of all peoples. Blesser of all peoples. So that's four words. So hopefully we can remember that uh, next week. So curse breaker and the blesser of all peoples. God's plan is to save humanity through Christ. To bless us through that salvation. And he wants us to be a part of it. I think that is what is most remarkable, is that God wants us to be a part of his plan of salvation. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, again, how you are clearly showing us the way, that you are clearly showing us the one to come, the the Messiah, the Christ, and that he is Jesus and that you have given us record of that. We thank you how uh, clear scripture is that we can make no mistake that from Genesis until we hit Matthew, the one that you are calling and that we should not be uh, individuals who cannot see this. Lord, you have made it plain as day and we are so grateful for that. We are so grateful that your plan will always come to fruition. That when you decree something, when you say something, it will happen. And we are grateful for that assurance that we can have. And I pray that we will be a people of faith. If we have never put our faith in Christ, that we will do that as we see clearly he is the one that God is pointing us to. Lord, if we are here and we are Christians and our faith has been shaken for whatever reason, over the last uh, few days or weeks or months or whatever. Lord, that you would just help us to have confidence in you. That we would be great people of faith, men and women and boys and girls, and following you. Because you'll do what you say. It is so rare in these days and ages to find people who are true to their word. But you are. And so is Jesus, and we're so grateful for that confidence. And Lord, may you restore and renew that confidence that we should have in you. And we pray all these things in your son's holy and precious name. Amen.